Father, we thank you tonight for your word as we look in this passage and see these things that uh, Ezekiel saw and the, the promise and the hope and the purpose of it all. We just pray they might encourage our hearts to being instructed in your glory and the fact that uh, you, do, you, do, you are on the throne regardless of what happens in, in your creation that seeks to thwart that. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we, we, we started down through chapter 1 last time, got down the first three verses, and I'm going to start back and we're going to pick up verse number 4. But let me just say a couple of things as we start chapter, verse number 4, because this begins the first vision. The first chapter is, is Ezekiel sees a vision of the Lord, a vision of the glory of the God of Israel. And he sees uh, some things in connection with that, that that often seem kind of inscrutable, but when you, we go down through it, you'll see it's really quite amazing. But the book of Ezekiel, if you read books about it, listen to preachers talk about it, there, there are two main things people talk about. One is the visions that he has. And he has a number of visions, and we'll see that here. And they're, they're, they're rather unique. But the other is the, the sign actions that he takes. He, he, he does a bunch of things, is, is told to do a bunch of things. And we looked at this when we just over, overview, over, get an overview of the book. A lot of actions that he takes that are, that, that are teaching methods to the nation. And those actions, are most of them are, are quite strange. Um, and so preachers like to call attention to that. But we're going to start with the vision because that's the first thing. And, and the visions are, they're not him going nuts. And when you, you hear people talk about a book, uh, something like this, that, you know, well, maybe he had epilepsy or maybe he was going out of his mind or, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. That, that's not what's happening at all. Literally, he's having prophetic visions. He's the only real uh, Old Testament prophet that has this kind of thing. We'll, we'll see it in, in, in other people. But they're, they're very unique. Now, it came to pass in the 13th year, in the, in, in the 30th year, I'm sorry, of the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, I was among the captives by the river Chabar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. Now, you notice it's plural. He's going to see more than one. But heaven opens. In other words, God is going to communicate with him. Verse number 3, the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Chabar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. That expression, the hand of the Lord was upon him, it's, it's repeated over and over in, in, in the visions. Chapter 3, verse 14. And chapter 1, 2, and 3, chapter 1, he has the vision. Chapter 2, he gets commissioned by the Lord. This is what you're going to do with what I'm, what I'm showing you. And chapter 2 and 3 take up the, the content of his commission. And then he gets on with, with the, uh, the, the prophecies in chapter 4. Chapter 3, verse 14. So the Spirit lifted me up. And took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heart of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. When he's talking about the hand of the Lord being on him, he's talking about God literally coming and moving him from one place to another geographically. And he takes him in a vision geographically and shows him things, and it's like time travel. And he moves him. Uh, if, if, you, if you recall... Come back to 1 Kings chapter 18. This is something that happens in the scripture. It's not uh, an, an uncommon thing. It's not somebody going out of their, you know, going out of their mind uh, or having, you know, one, one guy said, well, he had epilepsy. And I you think, well, I wonder where you get something like that, except you just don't believe what you read. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse number 12. Well, I'm looking at 2 Kings. Excuse me just a second. Get the right book, First Kings 18. Verse 12, And it came to pass, as soon as I, as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. So when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. The idea is he understands that God's literally going to come. And, and this is the, the Elisha, Elijah rather, and so forth. And Ahab's after him. And when it comes to pass, as soon as I am gone from thee, the servant says, the Spirit of the Lord is going to carry thee 
whither I know not what. So God's literally going to come and get Elijah and pick him up and geographically move him, and the guy won't, won't be able to tell him where he's at, and he says, when I do that, I can't do that, Ahab's going to bump me off. Elijah is, is, is going to be transported. The hand of the Lord is going to pick him up and move him. Acts chapter number 8, you remember Philip preaches to the eunuch in Acts 8. And after he finishes talking to the eunuch, the eunuch gets converted, verse 36, 37, 38. Then verse number 39. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Astos, and passing through, preached in all the cities. Philip finds it. He didn't choose to go there. God picked him up and moved him over there. One other place, Revelation chapter 1. I make that point just because the things that are happening to Ezekiel were, at the end of the first chapter, he says, I just fell on my face. <laughs> this has overwhelmed him. The book of the Revelation, when John is on the Isle of Patmos uh, to get this information, Chapter 1, verse 9, Revelation says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and, and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was, uh, people read that passage differently than I would read it. That's how he, he's exiled to Patmos because he's been preaching. When I read that, he's, he's not exiled, he's in Patmos for the word. He's there to get God's word. The next verse says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice and a trumpet. John is in somewhere in the first century and he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. That's the future from where we are today, time-wise. John is literally picked up out of the first century and transported geographically through time into a day that's ahead of where we are today. And you say, well, what is that? That's, that's what's called a vision. That's God giving information that otherwise, supernaturally, is the only way you could get it. So what we're going to look in as we study these visions in Ezekiel, you're going to have God giving information about what's coming in the future. And he's literally going to take Ezekiel into that future event and show it to him, and then he's going to write it down. So when we start in verse number 4, that, that, that's where we are. Ezekiel 1, verse 4. And verse 4 kind of gives you the, the heads up. Uh, the vision, if you go down to verse number, well, you go back, verse 1, it says the visions uh, of God. If you go down to verse number 26, what the, what the vision focuses on, and, and he says, and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man above it. Verse 28, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so is the appearance of the brightness round about it, and the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God, the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face. So what he's going to see here is an appearance. He's going to see a man sitting on the throne in the, heaven, in, in the heavens. And that man sitting on the throne is going to be the appearance of the glory of the God of Israel. If you look over at chapter number uh, 8, Oh, back at chapter 9, verse number 3. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherubim. Now, in chapter 9 and 10, he sees another vision. He sees this same group of people we're going to read about in chapter 9, chapter 1. He sees them again. He'll see them again in chapter 43. So this vision... Of, of what he sees in the heavens and this man sitting on the throne and the cherub and all that stuff has a continuous effect in chapter 9 and 10. The glory that he sees departs 
Israel. Chapter 43, it comes back. So he's going to be introduced to it in, in chapter 1, and he's going to see this, uh, the, uh, the, the glory of the God of Israel. And, and, and by the way, when he talks about here's the man on the throne, you, 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 you know, we know of, ultimately that's the word Jesus Christ, sitting on the throne of his glory. You see that in chapter 43 when he, when he comes back. But the, the appearance of that, the, when he says the appearance of the glory of the God of the glory of the God of Israel is not an inanimate object. The glory of the God of Israel is that man sitting on the throne. And it's his glory. It's not a campfire that, that you're seeing. It's not some, you know, UFO or, or, or flying saucer. It's the, Lord, it's the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, with all the holy angels with him, they shall sit upon the throne of his glory. We looked at that last time. That's in chapter 43. That's what this vision is, 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 is about. Here at the beginning, he says, Ezekiel, you guys are going into captivity. The crown has fallen from your head. Now, by the way, there's three sieges. Jerusalem isn't taken until the third one. Ezekiel was taken in the second one. So there's still, it'll be 13 you know, months later b b before the final. But Ezekiel is prophesying in that inter 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 intermittent time where Jerusalem and the temple are still standing, but they're going to be taken. So Daniel's been taken away, and, and the first siege, the city wasn't ra ravaged. The second si siege, the city was ravaged. The third one's going to be destroyed in the temple. But the temple's still standing, but it's, it's going. So chapter 1, verse 4. Here's what's coming. And I looked and beheld a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and brightness was about, about it, and out of the midst thereof was the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire, and also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. Now, here comes this whirlwind, here comes this cloud, here comes this fire, and it's, it's when a fire starts enfolding on itself, you know, when it's burning, it, it, it'll, it'll go up. But when a fire gets really hot and just feeds on itself, then it, it's, it's sort of in a, in a, in a cycle and burning on itself. And then there's, there's something in that fire. And then there's also something else. Well, what's in that fire is going to be these cherubim. I'm sorry, what's, what the other, something else is going to be the living creatures. What's in the fire, in verse 4, is the Lord. When it says the whirlwind coming out of the north, a cloud, that's, in, in, in the Bible, when, when you read that, that's talking about the Lord showing up. Come, come up with me in the book of Job. All, of the, all of these things that he sees, Ezekiel would be thoroughly familiar with, with, with what these things are, what they're talking about. If you come back to the book of Job, chapter 38, when you see the whirlwind, that's the Lord coming. That's a, that's, a, that's a picture of God showing up. Job 38, verse number 1. Then the Lord, Jehovah, answered Job out of the whirlwind. Well, if you look at chapter 37, at this also my heart trembled and is moved out of his place. Hear attentively the noise of his voice and the sound that goeth out of his mouth. He directeth it under the, under the heavens, his lightning unto the ends of the earth. After it a voice roareth, he thundereth with the voice of his excellence. And he will not stay them with his voice when, when, when his voice is heard. God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Here comes the, the that, that's why you hear people say, we know what God said, when, you know, how God, God's voice said, he thunders. Well, this, this storm, this hurricane, tornado, whatever you want to call it, the whirlwind, here, that's God showing up and the noise associated with it, the cloud. You remember Israel? They had a, the, the pillar of fire by day and the cloud by night. You remember Moses? When did he first see the Lord? In the burning bush, the bush that burned with fire, but wasn't consumed. These things are talking about the presence of God. Is, what Ezekiel is, when you sit afar off, that's what it looks like it's coming. 
and Ezekiel would have known God's coming. That's what I'm, fixed, I'm getting a vision about. When it says it comes out of the north, come back with me to, to uh, Psalm chapter 75. That's the, 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 the general idea there is that that's, coming, that's, that's the Babylonians coming. The, the strange thing about that is that Babylon is due east of Jerusalem. If you take a latitude, and here's Jerusalem, Babylon's right over here on the Euphrates. They, the path they would come would have to be, you know, because of the mountains out of the north. But really, when it says it's coming out of the north, it's, it's not just talking about Babylon. That's not what he's going to see. Psalm 75, Unto thee, O God, do we give thanks. Unto thee do we give thanks. For that thy name is near, thy wondrous works declare. When I shall receive the, the congregation, I will judge uprightly. The earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved. I bear up the pillars of it. I say unto the fools, deal not foolishly. And to the wicked, lift up, lift not up, I'm sorry, the horn. Lift not up your horn on high. Speak not with a stiff neck. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. Now think. If promotion doesn't come from the east, it doesn't come from the west, and it doesn't come from the south, where's the only other place it can come from? But it doesn't say the north. He says God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. From the hand of the Lord there's a cup and so forth. So when the psalmist describes, Asaph's going to describe where God's going to come from, he says the north. Because that's, that's the position in the Bible that God comes from. So when it says over here about God, he, he, this thing, Ezekiel would have known immediately, that's the, this is the, the storm cloud that's coming in the future, is really God coming. Now it's the Babylonians taking them into captivity. But that's really God's judgment on Israel. So God's going to judge the nation. And when the judgment comes, it's really going to be from the Lord. Get one, pass, one more passage, Psalm 18. And this, this, is, this one is... Can I show you how the, the, the figures work out here? Psalm 18, verse 6. In my distress... And this is David. In my, in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple. My cry came before him, even into his ears. When the earth shook and trembled, the foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because of his wrath. He was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils, and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also, and came down, and darkness was under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place, and, the, and his pavilion round about, about it, was dark, were, were dark waters and thick clouds of the sky. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, and so forth. You notice when he says in verse, all, all the things, darkness, the clouds, and the storms. Then he says, verse 10, he rode upon a cherub and did fly. And he did fly upon the wings of the wind. When you read in Ezekiel, if you go back there, about the cherub, you're going to read about them flying. You're going to read about their wings. That Psalm 18 is talking about the second coming of Christ. Here it's talking about the same operation, just at a different time. So when Ezekiel sees this, he's a priest. He knows God's word. He knows the temple. He knows the tabernacle. He worked in the temple. He never saw the tabernacle, but he knew about it. And these, the, the, these things that he's going to see 
are things that he's going to be thoroughly familiar with. In verse number 4, by the way, when it says at the end of it, out of the midst of the color of amber, uh, out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. The New Bibles change that, the word amber there, to uh, precious metal. Sometimes they call it gold, but a gleaming metal. Now that's, that's the LXX, the Septuagint translation, and, and the Vulgate. But that's the verse that people use, that and a couple of others, to say this passage is really about flying saucers because <laughs> it's this metal object and it's a UFO and you get all kind of weird stuff and the, the, I'll be another verse a little later on that, that you'll see where they do it that's not what's, what's, what's there what's in that whirlwind is what you see down in verse 26 and 27 and 28 it's, it's the Lord himself he's coming and Ezekiel is going to see God is going to bring judgment on Israel. And when it comes, it's not the God of the Babylonians that's doing it. It's the God of Israel doing it. Why? Because they've broken his, his commandments. Now, involved in it, here's how it's going to come about. Verse, verse 5. Also, it's not just God in it, but how's God showing up? Out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And everyone had four faces. And everyone had four wings. And their feet were straight feet. And the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. And they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went everyone straight forward. As for the likeness of, the, of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side. They four had the face of an ox on the left side. And they four had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces. And their wings were stretched upward. Two of every one were joined to one another, to, to another, and two covered their bodies. And they went, every one, straight forward, whither the Spirit was to go, and they went. And they turned not when they, when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps and it went up and down among the living creatures and the fire was bright and, and out of the fire went forth lightnings and the living creatures ran and returned to the appearance uh, as the appearance of a flash of lightning now as I beheld the living creatures behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures was with his four faces when you read that you say what in the Sam Hill is that? <laughs> and I, I, I used to, when Brother Bill Cash was alive, he was a master carpenter. And I used to get, I'd take a passage like that and say, Bill, draw me a picture of that, would you? And, and he, oftentimes he'd say, I, beyond me, I can't do it. Well, I couldn't draw a picture. I can kind of, I know what's going on, but I, I don't know how to visualize and describe it to you exactly. Like, so I can't draw it on the board. But it's really not that hard to figure out what's going on. Verse number, number five, there are four living creatures. Now, if you come over with me to chapter 10, those living creatures are identified and called cherubim. So what they are, is they're really, they're really the cherubim around the throne of God. Uh, chapter number uh, 10 Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims that appeared over them as it was a, a, a sapphire stone and as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. Now, he's going to describe, I'm seeing what I saw back in chapter 1, verse 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. We'll get there in a minute, and you'll see 
above the cherubim is the throne. And he spake unto the man clothed in linen, and said, Go in and between the wheels, and even unto the cherubim, and fill thine hand. So the guys that he's seeing here are cherubim. Now if you come down to verse number uh, four, uh, 14. And everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherubim, cherub. And the second face was the face of a man. By the way, cherub is the singular, cherubim is plural. So, just so you know what the difference in the spelling. The second face, the face of a man. The third face, the face of a lion. And the fourth face, of an eagle. And the cherubim were lifted up. This is the living creature that I saw by the river Chabar. So the living creatures back in chapter 1 are really the cherubim. So now I know who they are back here. Well, I know Ezekiel would know who cherubim are. He calls them living creatures so that you understand they're not inanimate objects. They're not things. They're real creatures. They're cherubim. They're not symbols. Most of the time all this stuff is, you know, is symbolic of this, symbolic. These are real guys, real beings in the heavenly court. So they're not they're not symbolic things. They're real creatures. Cherubim. Cherubim in your Bible. Come come with me just for a little little run run a few verses. Cherubim in the Bible are associated with the presence of God. You see it there in Ezekiel 1. Come to Genesis chapter 3. We were looking at this verse Sunday morning when we were studying about Cain and Abel. The first time you see a cherubim in, in the scripture text is Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. Adam and Eve have been put out of the garden, been separated from the presence of God. Verse 24, so he drove them, drove them out, drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way. And why did he do that? To keep the way to the tree of life. What it says to keep it is the idea of to guard it, protect it. Cherubim are charged with protecting, guarding, tending to, access to God. God's in the garden. And by the way, he's in the temple. He was in the tabernacle. He's in the heavenly temple. The garden, the tabernacle, the temple, and the heavenly throne room, there's all connections between those things. The cherubim, their job is to be around the throne of God, is to protect access to God. And they're involved in the personal presence of God, protecting, guarding the way. And they're responsible for access to the throne. And if you come to the book of Exodus, when, when Moses is given the instructions about setting up the tabernacle, in Exodus chapter 25, when he has the... the uh, the holy, the the the, the 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 sets up the tabernacle in the in the most holy place. He sets up the ark of the covenant, and on that ark of the covenant, he puts the mercy seat, where God's going to sit, and where, where man can be reconciled to him. And on that on either side of that mercy seat, there are two cherubim. There's a cherub on one side and a cherub on the other, over with their wings out, over uh, protecting that. Uh, that, that, that mercy seat, chapter 25, Exodus 25, verse 17. And thou shalt make a, a mercy seat of pure gold, two cubits and a half shall the length thereof, shall be the length thereof, and the cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work, and thou shalt make them in the two ends of the mercy seat and make one cherubim on, the, on one end and the other cherubim on the other end, even of the mercy seat. Shall you make the cherubim on the two ends and the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high 
covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall their face of the cherubim be. So over that mercy seat, you have the cherubim. Look at chapter 26. Not only do you have these big cherubim statues on the mercy seat, chapter 26, Moreover, thou shalt make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine linen, twined, uh, fine twine linen, and blue and purple and scarlet colors. You see these colors again in Ezekiel 1. With cherubim of cunning work shall thou make them. So you get the picture. The tabernacle is made out of, it's a tent made out of skins. And he says you take those ten curtains that you're going to make, and in them you embroider cherubim, pictures of cherubim. Do needlework, put them in there. When you're in the temple, in the tabernacle, everywhere you looked, you saw cherubim. You're surrounded by cherubim in the tabernacle. Now, only the high priest went into the, holy, into the most holy place to see those, but out in the, the functioning area where all, all the priests were, everywhere they looked, there's cherubim. If you come down to verse 30, 31, Thou shalt make a veil of blue, purple, scarlet, fine twined linen of cunning work with cherubim shall you make it. That's the veil between the, <clears throat> the holy place and the most holy. So in order to, <clears throat> when, when you walk up to the veil that says you can't go in there, there's cherubim standing there. <laughs> so everywhere you went, when you see the cherubim, they knew they're in the place where God dwells. So when Ezekiel would have seen that, come with me to 1 Kings, when Ezekiel would have seen that, he knew we're talking about God's throne. When he sees the man on the throne, he knows who that is. That's God's man. When Solomon builds the temple, 1 Kings chapter 6, he builds cherubim. But he builds four cherubim, not two. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 23, And within the oracle, that's the whole, most holy, he made two cherubim, of olive tree, each ten cubit high. Those are the cherubim that are going to be over the mercy seat. Then verse 25, And other cherubim with ten cubits, both the cherubim were of one measure and one size. That's two more that are put upon the side. Psalm 80 verse 1, he said, talks about Jehovah being he who dwells who sits between the cherubim, his throne is there. So when you're seeing the cherubim, come with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 28. When Ezekiel sees these four living creatures, he knows they're cherubim. And he knows that they have to do with access to the presence of God and his throne. Now there's a, there's a fascinating thing in Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel just picks stuff out of Israel's, the temple, the tabernacle, and, and, and so forth. But what he's describing is the throne of God being moved. So here's, the, here's God's presence and God's throne in Israel, and God's moving it. And that's what these cherubim, that's all that stuff about the wings and the wheels and all that stuff about the cherubim. It's describing how the cherubim move the throne of God. They're the transporters and the transporting vehicle, 1 Chronicles chapter 28. And I'm just going to read, read, read one passage because I, I, if we go down through all this, uh, verse 11, Then David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch, and of, the, and of the houses thereof, and the treasures, uh, verse 12, and the pattern of all that he had by the spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord. David got the pattern for the, Moses got the pattern for the tabernacle, the temp, the tabernacle from God. David gets the, the pattern for the temple from the Lord. And, and he gives all the information to, to Solomon who's going to build it. 
Verse number 18, after, And for the altar of incense, refined gold by weight, and gold for the pattern, watch, of the chariot of the cherubim, that spread out their wings and cover the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Notice there is a chariot that the cherubim have, and the purpose of the chariot is what, is what you're reading about over here in Ezekiel chapter 1. So what you're going to be reading about when you're reading about all this, this moving and the apparatus that moves these, these guys, and the reason it talks about how they go and what they're doing is because you're, 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 you're getting a description of the chariot of the cherubim and how it's going to transport the throne of, God, of the God of Israel, the God of the glory of Israel. And what he's going to do, chapter 9, he's going, to, he's going to take that glory and it's going to leave. And in chapter 43, it's going to come back. So the mechanism, you, you see, it, it didn't just go, he didn't just, doesn't just go, and it's gone. There's, this stuff's real. The throne of God in Israel was real. His throne over the earth being exercised through Israel. And the cherubim had to do with with the, with the exercising and the carrying out of, the, of God's governmental authority in the earth. And when you get over to Revelation chapter number 4, and you see him in the throne room there, and it's all about the line of the tribe of Judah coming, taking the title deed of the universe, of the earth rather, and taking it up and, and putting it in, and, and claiming it. He's got the power, now he's going to go and do it. Well, when you see that Revelation 4, those living creatures are there, those cherubim are there, and they're instruments of his government, of carrying out his government. Now, when he's going to take away the throne from Israel, they're going to be what usher him away. So all this, to me, it's inter it, the interest that I have in it is that it's fast, it takes you into the, the other world, <laughs> the invisible realm, and you see how things operate where, the, where, where God's throne is. Go back with me to verse, chapter number, verse number five. I, I'd like to get, I thought I'd get through all this. I, obviously, I'm not going to, time's going to run out. But uh, verse number, number six. And everyone had four faces. And everyone had four wings. And their feet were straight feet. And the sole of their, their, their feet was like the sole of a, of a calf's foot. So they have the appearance of a man, and they have, they have their feet are straight. What he's talking about, you have an ankle in your foot, like that. There's like a calf, no ankle, it's straight. The reason for that has to do with the fact that these four guys, you got four faces, that the four corners of, 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 the, of, of the platform that, where, where the, the throne is, and when it talks about, like in verse 9, the wings were joined one to another, and they turned not when they, when they went. They went everyone straight. In other words, if you've got four faces, one's looking this way, one's looking that way, one, there, there's a thing that you hear people say, watch out for your six in security. I mean, watch out for who's behind. You need eyes in the back of your head. So nobody jumps out. They got eyes in the back of the head. They got eyes this way, this way, this way. This guy's looking this way, observing. He didn't have to look over there and check. He didn't have to look over there and check because his face is that way. So the four faces make, them, make each one of these guys able to instantly move in any direction that they need to move in. And they're fully aware, they're full of eyes. They're fully aware of what's out there. They're absolute excellent security guys. They're actually excellent transporters. They can move any direction instantly. They don't have to adjust their footing. They don't have to adjust their thing. They, they're, they're completely and totally able to observe all directions. Verse number 11, thus were their faces. And their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined to one another. And the two covered their bodies. And they went, every one, straight forward whether the spirit was to go. They went, and they turned not when they went. They didn't have to adjust anything. They instantly could go in any way. So you've got, on each corner, you've got one of these cherubim. And 
you, the, 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 man, the one with the man's face is looking, well, God's up here, so he's looking, God's looking down at him. Then on the right, his right is the lion. On his left over here, if he's at this corner, he can look that way as the lion. He look back here, and, and there's the ox. And then over here at his six is the eagle. The lion can look over here, see the man over here, he looks at the eagle. The eagle look here, he sees the lion, and he sees the ox. Every corner, these, they're, they're covered. This, this, this guy here takes his wings, holds it out. This guy holds his wing out like this, and they touch. He holds his other wing out, his other wing out, and they touch. He holds his wing out, so they make a box. On that box is the platform of the throne. Look down at verse number 22. And the likeness of the firmament upon their heads, I'm talking about the, 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 uh, the creatures, verse 21, when those went, these went. Uh, I, I didn't read down through the passage. Start back in verse number 15. Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold one wheel upon the earth by, by the living creatures with his four faces. So they're on the earth at this point. By the way, the wheels. If you go back to 1 Kings, we didn't read it back, but you read about the wheels in the tabernacle, in the temple. And you read about the axle. You read about, all these, these are things. If you're going to move, if you've got a chariot and you've got, this guy's got wheels, wheel, you've got a four-wheel chariot. <laughs> and it's got wheels within a wheel. In other words, you've got a wheel, and then at a perpendicular angle, you've got another wheel. So you don't have to have a steering mechanism. You don't have to change directions. You can just go any which way. How? The spirit that's in the cherubim tell it where to go. There's instant communication between the cherubim and the apparatus that they're operating. Verse 19, when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. In other words, it's a, trans it's a, it's a transportation platform. We talk about four-wheelers. We talk about, you know, we understand this terminology in the way we think about it. Whether the spirit was to go, they went, verse 20, whether it was their spirit to go, thither was their, was their spirit to go. And the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. When those went, these went. And when, when those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the spirit of the living creatures, the living creature was in the wheel. So they're directed by the, the, the spirit that's in the creature, and, the, and, and those cherubim are doing what? They're doing the will of God. They know what God's will is. The likeness of the firmament, now watch, upon the heads of the living creature. So over the heads of these cherubim, there's a firmament. Again, that goes back to Genesis chapter 1. All of creation is a picture of this throne room of God. Because God is God, you can't limit him in time and space, but because he is God, he can choose to manifest himself in a geographic location. And that's what, heaven, that's what the third heaven's about. And when he made the universe, he made it as a place for him to dwell. He had a dwelling in the third heaven, now he's made a place to put his dwelling. When he made man, he made a garden for him to dwell in with man. When he made the tabernacle, there I will dwell with you. When he made the temple, there I will dwell with you. So all these things, the, the, the figures of speech that are used here, the items are all connected. So over the heads, by the way, that word firmament means a, a beaten out place, a place that is firmly uh, fixed. It's a platform. You, you'll sit in Revelation chapter 4, it's called a sea of glass. It's transparent, clear as crystal, he's going to tell you here. It's, upon, it's over the heads of the living creatures. was the color of terrible crystal. When it says terrible, it's talking about awesome. It's not talking about, you know, boo, boo, boo bad. <laughs> uh, it's, it, it, it's, you looked at it and just stunning. Stretched forth over their heads. And under the firmament were their wings straight, the one toward the other. Everyone had two, which covered on, on this side, and, and everyone had two which covered on that side. And literally you have the, the, the wings of the cherubim 
are the, are the things that pick up the throne and carry it. And when they went, I heard the noise of, of their wings like the noise of, of great waters, as the voice of the, of the Almighty, the voice of speech, the, the noise of an, of an host. When they stood, they let down their wings. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood, and they let down their wings. By the way, we talk about that voice, the noise of their wings, like the great waters, the voice of the Almighty, that, that's the, the whirlwind stuff, the thunder back then, Job. When, when our, the U.S. military attacks something, they use a thing they call shock and awe. When the Russians attacked Ukraine back in the first part of the year, one of the things you kept seeing, I kept seeing the military people looking at it, saying, well, we would use shock and awe. Boom! Russians don't use that. They, use a, they, 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 think they, they have a thing they call grind it out. They just slowly plod and go in. Well, the Lord's using shock and awe. This is bang! Woo! There it is. It's his coming. The judgment. What's, a, what's, in that firm, what's, what's in that platform over their heads? Verse 26. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man above upon it. There's the throne and there's Jehovah sitting on his throne. Hold your hand there and come back to Exodus chapter 24. When it talks about that sapphire stone, that's a signal for you to go back. Would have been a quick symbol for Ezekiel. Exodus 24. God's telling them about the tabernacle. They're going to build it. Exodus 24 verse, verse 9. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadad and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. So they go up on Mount Sinai and they saw the God of Israel and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone and as it were the body of heaven in its clearness. Moses, Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, those 70 elders, getting their commission to build a temple, the tabernacle, I'm sorry. They literally go into that throne room and they see that platform that the throne's on, the paved work of sapphire stone, and they see the body of heaven. They see, as it were, the appearance of a man. They, they see the glory of the God of Israel sitting on that throne because that's the throne he was going to sit on in the earth through his people. So what Ezekiel is seeing is here is the God of Israel. And the point is he's still in control. They're being ca carried away into Babylonian captivity. We'll look at some of these verses next week because I didn't get to them because we need to explain the, about the four faces and things. But they're carried... If you're in Ezekiel chapter 1, look, look at, turn to the left, Lamentations chapter 5. Now look at verse 16. Lamentations takes place after Jerusalem is destroyed. It's later than Ezekiel. But here's what's coming. Lamentations 5 verse 16. The crown is fallen from our head. Woe unto us that we've sinned. God literally took the crown for Israel to be the head of the nations and took it away because of their sin. And Ezekiel sees right at the beginning that even though we're going into captivity, the God of Israel is still on the throne. He's still in control. And even though the glory departs, it's going to come back. So it starts out with a very clear statement for Ezekiel to understand 
He's encountering the God, the glory of the God of Israel in the form of a man, in a cloud on the throne. And the one that's in charge is not the Babylonian gods. It's Israel's God. And the captivity, the losing of the throne, is only temporary. And he's going to bring it back. And he does that. You say, go away in chapter 9, 10, and 11, and you say, bring it back, chapter 43. But in the interval, there's the, the, the judgment, the captivity, and so forth. So what Ezekiel is going to have to go do and tell his people is that we are going into captivity. We're not going back. But our God is still in control because what's happening in captivity is he's chastening us as he said he would if we break the, co break the covenant. So when you understand that and you go back to Ezekiel, we'll go back to chapter 1 and go down through a little more of the details of this stuff next time because there's a lot of fascinating things here. These four faces, these four guys, uh, one of the things that they do the order of their, of their appearance in chapter 10 is different than in chapter 1. And then the order in Revelation chapter 4 is the four, same four guys, but you see them from a different angle. And there's some reasons for that. And you need to understand why those four faces are there. One of the cherubim, in Ezekiel chapter 28, he explains that Lucifer was originally one of those cherubim. Originally there were five. And Lucifer fell and became Satan, which is a fascinating thing. That's why the emphasis there about the Spirit telling them what to, where to go, what to do, and then responding positively to that instantly. No conflict, just instant response. Because he's making the point that these cherubim are not fallen. And that emphasis is there because one of them did. And it, is, it was possible these didn't. So there's a lot of things involved in it that just to see and, and look at. But there aren't any UFOs and there aren't any flying saucers and there aren't any heaven, you know, some spook from, from outer space. This, this is God's throne. And it's, it's the, there's a movie, The Transporter. Have you ever seen that? No. You guys don't watch movies late at night, huh? It's got a sequel, Transporter 2. It, it, it isn't real good, but... I, I, every time I think about this, I think about that. The guy's hired to transport people. These guys' job is to protect the throne, move it where it needs to go. And they do. Okay? All right. Okay. Yeah, I knew if I tried to do 28 verses, it would not be possible. So, But you get, I hope you get the overview of it. We'll go back to some of a little more detail next time. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, for a little insight into your presence into the glory of the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, our God. We thank you for the privilege of knowing you. In Christ's name, amen. All right, praise the Lord.